Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Jim Thompson, founder and executive director of Positive Coaching Alliance. Before founding Positive Coaching Alliance in 1998, Jim was director of public and global management programs at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. In 2004, he was recognized as an Ashoka Innovators for the Public Fellow for Outstanding Social Entrepreneurship. The Positive Coaching Alliance focuses on the positive aspects of youth sports and away from a winning at all costs mentality. The Alliance has received the support of some of the sports world's most visible public figures, including Phil Jackson, Bill Bradley, and Summer Sanders. Jim has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us. And I'd like to thank you, Jim, for joining us today. My pleasure. Sports, youth, and then the mentality of sportsmanship on the one hand, and winning, winning, winning at all costs on the other. How did you end up coming to this place where you founded this organization with the purpose of bringing the sportspersonship or sportsmanship uh, back into the world of youth sports? I think uh, it's all about helping kids become the very best they can be. Uh, I had an a experience uh, early in my career as a, a teacher with emotionally disturbed behavior problem kids, and I was trained in a, what I would call a relentlessly positive approach. These are kids who are very, very disturbed. Um, and we set limits. They couldn't run wild. But within those limits, everything they did positive, they got reinforced for. And we saw some really amazing transformations. Now, fast forward several years later, I'm a, a first-year business student at Stanford Business School. My son is starting... Uh, soccer, basketball, and baseball, and I was a little bit appalled by what I saw, the behavior of the adults, coaches and parents, which made sports just a miserable experience for a lot of kids. And so I started out with the idea, how do we keep adults from doing bad things to kids that will drive them out of sports? Once I got into Positive Coaching Alliance full-time, I uh, realized, wow, there is no better platform to create what we call major league people. If you're talking about character education, youth sports is it. There's an endless procession of teachable moments. If the coaches and parents involved see them and capitalize on them. So sports is, is an experience that individuals have, children have, they live in a, in, in a world in which they are experiencing the interaction with other players, with opponents, with teammates. They are meeting the challenge of the discipline of becoming good at something. And meanwhile, they're interacting with their parents. When you talk about sports being a teachable, uh, a teachable moment, is this about teaching those aspects or is it teaching how to use sports in, in your daily life as a context for resolving other problems or is it is a mixture? Well, I think it's both. Um, virtually everything an adult needs to be successful um, you find in youth sports. First of all, mastery. Really, the very best athletes, the very best in any profession, are people that focus on mastery. So it's not about winning this moment, this game. It's about getting better. And if you relentlessly focus on getting better, over time, you're successful in the scoreboard. So that's the first thing. How do I make myself better as an athlete? Uh, and then as a husband, as a uh, professional person, as a contributing member of society. There's some really powerful research from sports psychology now that says that the athletes, the teams, the coaches who focus on winning on the scoreboard actually do more poorly than uh, folks who focus on mastery. And we talk about the elm tree of mastery, E for effort, give your best effort every time, L for learning, have a teachable spirit, you're a sponge soaking up things, and M for mistakes, bounce back from mistakes. Coaches who get their kids to focus on effort, learning, and bouncing back from mistakes, those kids can't wait to go to practice. They're excited about challenges. Uh, they actually get better over the course of a season, and they outperform athletes who are relentlessly driven towards winning on the scoreboard. The easiest way to put uh, points on the board can sometimes be through poor behavior and through well, shortcuts. Yeah, the easiest way to win is to play really weak opponents. So if all you're thinking about is winning on the scoreboard, it just becomes kind of ridiculous after a while. Um, but if you're challenging yourself, we, we say a worthy opponent is a gift. 
because I can't win. If you and I are playing tennis and you're pretty good and I'm pretty good, I can't beat you unless I rise to my best. Right. If, if you're no good and I'm really good, well, that's, that's no fun for either of us. So that idea of mastery, I want to pit myself against somebody who's a little bit better than me because then I have a chance to win if I rise to the you know, Sometimes uh, kids and adults are, are, are all about winning. Is there a psychological shift that you're encouraging? Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about a win-at-all-cost mentality versus a, um, a double-goal coach mentality. A double-goal coach. First goal is winning. Uh, I like to tell people, you know, I live in Northern California and I like granola, but I'm really a pretty competitive person, and there's nothing wrong with competition. In fact, kids need to learn how to compete because we live in a competitive world. And there's nothing wrong with winning. No, winning is, is great. Um, <laughs> There may be more teachable moments associated with losing <laughs> than with winning, although even there, uh, there are plenty. Um, but that, that second goal of using sports to teach life lessons. If a coach adopts the, the mentality of a double goal coach, yeah, I'm trying to prepare these kids to win, but boy, I can have an impact, a lifelong impact on kids. How many kids remember what happened in their fourth grade math classroom? Fourth grade basketball, fourth grade baseball, Oh boy, they remember that. So coaches can have a lifelong impact if they're focusing on that long term. Just one example. Let's say you want to win uh, really, really badly as a coach, and so you look for opportunities to keep your weaker players on the bench. Now, great coaches get kids in the game because that's where kids can learn. And I would say in some cases, the kids who don't have a lot of talent have as much to learn from sports as anybody else because they may go off to be an attorney, uh, and they may develop a software program. They may do all kinds of things that can help the world. And the resilience, the determination, the things they learn through sports are exactly what they need to be successful in whatever their chosen profession is. Isn't the coach then redefining their role from this idea of, of winning on the field to winning both on the field and off the field? Right, and we actually talk about redefining what it means to be a winner. Um, a winner is somebody who gets back up when they've been knocked down. And you can't get up if you haven't been knocked down. So we actually say that anything that happens, uh, your team plays perfectly, win the game easily, there are teachable moments there about empathy, about grac graciousness to the opposing team. And if things go badly, there's just tons of teachable moments. So once a coach makes that transition from I'm I get my validation from my team winning on the scoreboard to saying, yeah, I want them to do well on the scoreboard, but I also get my validation from helping these kids become the best people they can be. Then, wow, it's just a whole different thing. You go out on a, on a baseball field or a football field and you see things that, that were invisible before, things that can make a difference in people's lives. So unpack the program for, for us. Uh, who, who are your constituents? Who is the program shaped uh, for? And, and how, do the, how does the program unfold? Right, so we take a systems approach, uh, a youth sports organization. We start with the leaders. The leaders really are our customers. If we were a, a for-profit, we'd say the leaders of youth sports, uh, soccer clubs, little leagues, et cetera, those are our customers. Uh, we're serving them so they can then bring the coaches in line, the parents on board, and the athletes themselves. When you get all four of those groups on the same page, same vocabulary, same goals, there's really nothing more beautiful than a youth sports experience for kids, the coaches, and their family. And are you providing uh, training for, for these constituents? Right, we, we do workshops for leaders on organizational culture. Uh, most of us like to think, well, we're independent, you know, lone wolf type things, but, but really we're all pack animals. We want to belong to whatever organization we want to belong to. So organizational culture, which we define as the way we do things here, we teach leaders of organizations how to create that culture so people understand how they're supposed to behave. Then we do workshops for coaches on how to be a double goal coach, very practical, tool-based, so it's not just, hey, be more positive. Here's a tool, a mistake ritual effort goals, things that coaches can use to put these ideas into practice. We then do workshops for parents on being what we call a second goal parent. That first goal of winning belongs to the coaches and the kids. You as a parent should be focused on what your kids can learn from sports that will help them be successful in life. And then we're really excited about the athlete model, which we call the triple impact competitor. Make yourself better, make your teammates better, make the game better by the way you compete. 
So if you win, great. If you lose, you feel good, you feel proud, your family, your school, your community can feel proud of you as well. Could you triangulate between the work that you're doing now and the work that you previously uh, did as the director of uh, public and global management programs at the Stanford Graduate School? It seems that, that taking a systems approach and taking a cultural approach um, has um, some real reverberations for some of what is being done in business today. Absolutely. You know, when I, I, I was an MBA student at Stanford, and then I went back a year or so later to direct the public and global management programs, and my wife had a great phrase. She said, you know, a lot of your classmates have unmet needs for altruism. You know, if you, you think about, and, and Stanford has a, a big focus on, on public service, uh, I think a life that is lived just for yourself and just for your family is a pretty, ultimately a pretty sad life. And people who give of themselves to the community and MBA students who go on to become leaders in business have great platforms to, to do wonderful things, to serve on nonprofits, to, to start responsible uh, companies, all kinds of things like that. So I think there's that connection. I think the, the, the other connection between that work and what I'm doing now is uh, I get really excited about seeing the potential people have. So whether it's a Stanford Business School student and this person has the potential to make a huge positive impact in the world, or seeing a six or seven or eight-year-old who uh, you know, can't, even, can't even put the bat on the ball, and then seeing him or her improve uh, and become, uh, to, to see themselves, uh, see their potential, the vision, the sense of possibility they can have, that's really exciting. And isn't the, the approach that you are, are uh, talking about uh, being um, focused on two goals instead of one goal, uh, doesn't that also have application to all of our lives as professionals, as people in business? You know, we can very easily get captivated by the winning at all costs idea yep. um, uh, to the detriment of ourselves and of our communities. Yeah, so the, the, the triple impact competitor, that first level is making myself better, focusing on mastery. Second level is making my teammates better. Uh, we actually call that leadership. Leadership isn't telling people what to do. It's making the people around you better. Now. Can, can we see how that would help people be successful in life, in business? I mean, everybody wants to work with or for somebody who makes them better. Well, making your vendors better as well, not treating them poorly and trying to figure out a way to, to transfer wealth between yourself and your customers or your vendors or whatever, yeah. instead trying to make each other better. So Herm Edwards, who uh, at the time was the head coach of the Jets, um, I, I had a meeting with him, got, he got very excited about Positive Coaching Alliance. Later that night I did a workshop for a soccer club in Long Island and I mentioned that I had met with Herm Edwards earlier that day and a guy came up to me afterwards. He was a vendor for the Jets and he said when, when Herm became the, the coach, he, he got all the vendors together and it's like, why, why does he want <laughs> us? And his point was, you're part of the Jets team. And you know, later I met uh, uh, Bill Walsh, the 49ers coach, and he got involved with PCA. Um, and he did the same thing. His view was to make the 49ers the very best uh, franchise in the NFL. He needs everybody on that team. And his definition of a franchise was the team, the staff, the vendors, the fans, fans. the media. This idea that making the people around you better, that's leadership. If we then go to the third level of making actually the game better, uh, so for high school athletes, how can you you have a lot of power and status in your school. What can you do to help make your school better? A, a, a very small but he, a very important example is bullying. There's bullying going on in, in sc high schools all across this country. Sometimes athletes are involved with it. Um, and what if the athletes, you know, the star athletes in the school uh, got involved with an anti-bullying campaign? That would, that would be so much more powerful than the kids being bullied because the athletes have that power. So all of those things, making yourself better, making your teammates better, and making our society better, reverberate back to, to helping you live a life that you want to live. And the thing that strikes me, whether it's in uh, the sports world or the business world, is, is the true artists are always shifting the game. The game is being reshaped, the principles that result in victory are being reformed by people who are thinking in that in that kind of a deep way. Ab absolutely, the, uh, you know. Sometimes there are trade-offs to be made. Like I want to win this game, 
and my pitcher's got a little bit of sore arm. Uh, it's really not that bad. He's my best pitcher. I want to keep him out there. Um, sometimes you're trade-offs. Like, no, I want to win the game, but the health, the health of my of kid is way, way more important. But the really interesting, wonderful research, from, again, from sports psychology is that you actually win more by building the character of your players. So if you teach kids how to set goals, how to make a commitment towards that goal, how to monitor their improvement towards the goal, how to adjust the goal if it's too easy or too hard, they're going to be better athletes. And by showing loyalty to your athletes and to your teammates, uh, you also build a, a commitment to the shared objective that you would not otherwise have. Yes, I mean, there are so many pitfalls that cause a, a sports team, a business, uh, anything we can think of to go wrong. I mean, it's really hard to be excellent. It's hard to maintain excellence over a long period of time. And when you have a team of people that you're, we talk about filling the emotional tank. Everybody has an emotional tank. When it's full, people want to come to practice. They want to work hard. They like working with each other. When their tank is empty, oh, they're discouraged easily. Um, and so we actually, in Positive Coaching Alliance, we talk about the emotional tank all the time. Like, if I came into the office, I usually come in bubbling and, you know, whistling and stuff. If I come in uh, like this, you know, it won't be 10 minutes before somebody says, hey, Jim, how's your E-tank? Because we know that what we're trying to do, we're trying to change the whole culture of youth sports. Never been done. We're not exactly sure all the ways to do it. It's hard and we get discouraged. And so we got to fill each other's emotional tank. And that'll help us achieve excellence. How does funding for the organization work? Well, we get about a third of our funding from earned income from youth sports organizations that pay us to train coaches, parents, etc. About two thirds of it comes from uh, philanthropists, individual donors, uh, family foundations, and the like. And we also get support from uh, found, uh, from corporations like Deloitte, the big supporter, and Liberty Mutual and Nike, for example. So we've created a vision, I think, of what youth sports could be like that a lot of people want to be part of. You mentioned Phil Jackson, for example, uh, Doc Rivers, the Celtics coach. We have a lot of people uh, who want to be part of this because they see what's not going well in youth sports and what the potential could be. What is their motivation? I mean, they see what's not going well in, in youth sports, but they have a a lot of ways to express that that passion. Are, are they worried about the the values um, that are being uh, permeated in 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 youth sports? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, Phil Jackson said to me, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of. At that time, he had only ten NBA titles. He said, I'm really proud of the ten NBA titles I have, but I really want the success of Positive Coaching Alliance to be part of my legacy. So he's actually thinking, you know, that double goal. Yeah, he wants, uh, he wants to be the best coach he could be. Um, and it's hard to argue that he may be the, the greatest coach of all time. Uh, but he also wants to, to leave the world a better place. So he's thinking about, about this coaching as a continuum from childhood all the way through to professional sports where he has been at the pinnacle. He is. Um, you know, he had, he had some coaches who... Um, took a very negative when at all cost approach with him and then he had Red Holtzman who coached him when he was with the Knicks and he loved you know he loved the way Red Holtzman coached him and the results he got from that and he talks about his transformation uh, Phil Jackson does the the first time he coached he got kicked out of the first NBA game he played <laughs> he, co he coached in he led the league in technical fouls that year um, because he had been coached that way so often but he's a smart guy, and he realized this isn't working. And so, um, you know, I was I was very proud because Rich Kelly, who played with uh, with Phil in the NBA, introduced me to Phil, and he read my first book, Positive Coaching: Building Character and Self Esteem Through Sports. And so that's how we got to know each other. And and he locked on to this idea we call it the magic ratio: uh, five positives, five tank fillers for every criticism. It's not that criticism is important. It's not that you don't have hard conversations with your players when they're not giving their best effort, for example. But if you're on them all the time, their emotional tank is drained and they don't play well. So and they you, can't respond to the criticism. Right. The idea of the, the magic ratio is when kids, or when, and he's talking about NBA players, when those players are recognized for the good things they're doing, now it's time to have that hard conversation, that criticism. They're open to it much more so. 
Uh, we can take that into our personal lives. Yeah, and he actually said that that, uh, that really helped him be a better NBA coach, and he'd only won two NBA titles at, at the time he read my first book, so I take credit for all the, <laughs> and PCA takes credit for all of his, uh, his wins after that. Well, Jim Thompson, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, and thank you for your insights. Oh, it's been fun. Thank you.